All right. Uh, well, uh, I'll be talking about the multi x scale project today, also about EASY. So I will explain a little bit what is EASY, what is multi x scale, how do they tie together. Um, and thanks to Bart, because you already gave a very nice introduction about CFMFS and things like that. So I can probably go quickly through the slide that covers CFMFS. Uh, so my name is Kasper van Leeuwen. I work at SURF. Uh, I've been working at SURF for the past six years now. Uh, done some HPC work, some high performance machine learning. Uh, and if you've seen my name on GitHub somewhere floating around, I already had a couple of people who said like, hey, I think I'm, I've seen your GitHub tag somewhere. Uh, that's correct. I'm also an EasyBuild maintainer and I made some contributions to EasyBuild itself as well. Um, so yeah, if you want to complain or talk to me about RPAS support or easy stack files, those are the things that I've mainly worked on. Uh, and of course, some easy config uh, contributions. Um, before I start, uh, there was a talk yesterday that was covering, you know, how difficult it can be to maintain a local software stack because all of the scientific software, you know, it doesn't really adhere to any versioning standards or, you know, even explain how you should install this piece of software, right? People just take a script from somewhere, they find some uh, GitHub repository in a publication and they think, oh, I can use the same thing, uh, but it contains zero information on how to install it and how to get it running. Uh, there was actually an initiative in the Netherlands, uh, not by us, but by a, a sister organization of SURF, um, to help scientists a little bit think about this in advance and to write what they call a software management plan. Um, so it's an interesting read if you want to try to stimulate your scientists to do a little bit better on the software development side and, and think about these things in advance. Uh, it could be nice to, uh, to point them out to this. Uh, so, small disclaimer, I was on the sounding board for this, uh, for this guide, so I'm not completely independent. Um, but one of the tables that is, you know, to me was quite, uh, quite useful is it basically this, all of the things that you should think about, right? But then, I'm um, sorry, it's a little bit small, I know. <laughs> um, but it also says like, okay, you know, how deep you should go into your software management also depends on what you think the expected impact of that software is, right? Is this a script that you're just developing for yourself? Is it going to be used by one or two colleagues, or is this going to be used by tens or hundreds of people also maybe outside your department, right? Those require different levels of, uh, of software management. And deployment documentation is one of the things that's being pointed out to the scientists as being an important, uh, an important aspect to think about. All right, so on to the actual topic. Uh, I have a dream, and my dream is that scientists can run their computation on any computer infrastructure they want, with whatever software they need on any data that they want. And of course, since I'm an HPC person, also making the most efficient usage of that compute infrastructure. Um, and I don't think I'm alone in that dream, because EASY also has a dream, which is to provide a cross-platform, ready-to-use, optimized software stack. And by that we mean cross-platform, it should run on anything from a laptop to an HPC cluster, just as Bart mentioned. It should be ready to use, so it's just mount and go, right? There should be no effort in getting this thing installed or anything. It should be optimized, so it should make the most out of your hardware. Uh, so it should recognize what CPU architecture are you using and do something sensible for that CPU architecture. Uh, and of course, it should be a stack of scientific software because that's what we want to run, right? So basically, that ticks already two of my boxes. So for me, this is an important project. You know, if we get easy going, then... Uh, we're sort of halfway uh, there for my dream. We're not doing this alone. There's a big group of people involved. Uh, you'll recognize some of the Dutch universities, uh, also uh, University of Cambridge, um, but also we see cloud vendors that are very interested in this. Uh, big HPC centers throughout Europe are interested in this. Uh, so it's definitely something that, you know, um, uh, that falls into fertile ground, this idea, right? Um, I think also what a lot of people here will recognize is that HPC centers spend a lot of time managing their software environments for their users because it's a complex environment. Uh, and of course, the focus on performance for us is important because we know that if users run big calculations and if they can do this even just 5% more efficiently, uh, that can mean a lot of hardware that is associated with that and therefore a lot of money, right? So it's important to think about this optimization. Um, at the same time, we live in an increasingly complex world, so there's more and more research software out there. Uh, we get, at least at SURF, we know that we get more non-traditional HPC users who often also uh, lack HPC experience. Uh, 
uh, especially from the machine learning community, we see a lot of people, uh, for example, from social sciences who've never used the HPC system before, but now they want to do some machine learning and they actually need quite a, a fair amount of compute, and they now land on our cluster. That's a hard user group to serve. Um, and then we also have more and more flavors of hardware out there. So all in all, it, it's a daunting challenge for HPC staff. Um, of course, this is not new, right? I mean, it's one of the reasons we're here. Uh, we're all using easy build. Uh, there's other build tools, we have spec. And this is basically our effort of sharing that burden a little bit with other people from the HPC support community, right? Uh, we can standardize our build recipes according to some format, and it doesn't matter if that's spec or easy build, but it allows you to share what you know about how a certain piece of software should be installed with the rest of the community. Um, but each site still installs their own uh, stack, and if you want to do proper software testing, you kind of need to do that yourself, right? So, yeah, we share some of the effort, but there's also some of the effort that we don't share yet. Um, and if you look on the easy build Slack, you'll notice, you know, even if we have an easy config, uh, build procedures don't always work out of the box, right? You might be running on a different operating system uh, than the person who developed the easy config, and suddenly for you, you get a problem. Um, and that is one of the ideas of Easy, is kind of to take that next step in sharing this burden, right? Rather than working on build recipes and then doing the build ourselves on our own systems, why don't we work together and actually build one uh, copy of the software stack so that everybody can just use that, that same copy? Um, also, I think there's a big benefit to end users, so it's not just us HPC support people. Uh, but for the end user, if you want to move from one system to another, and this is also something that Bart already mentioned uh, that is important uh, in Canada as well, um, we get the same request in the Netherlands from uh, the tier two sites. So those are the local universities. They often have their own clusters. Um, and what we see is that users come from there, right? They start there, and when they outgrow their own cluster, they come to us. Um, but it's a lot of hassle because it means they need to recreate their own software environment. They need to move their data. Okay, the data moving part we cannot solve here, uh, but it's usually the software recreation part that takes a lot of effort because you know, they try to set it up in the same way, but they still get a slightly different result, and then you have to figure out why, right? Did they get a certain mismatching version or whatever, or something else, a configure flag that was slightly different? Uh, yeah, that's a lot of hassle. So it would be much nicer if they can just use the same software environment on, on any of these systems. So what is the scope for EASY? Well, we want to create one shared repository of optimized software installations. Uh, we want to try to avoid as much as possible uh, duplication of work between IT support teams. Uh, we want to provide a uniform way of, uh, of providing software to our end users, regardless of which system they use. And it should work on any Linux OS. And we've also tried this on the Windows Server system for Linux, and possibly we'll make it work on Mac OS. I don't think that works right now. Um, and it should work on a wide range of system architectures, right? We cannot know which cluster user will want to run this on, so uh, it needs to cover a wide range. And then we'll have a very strong focus on performance, also on automation, testing, and collaboration. So one of the questions that we often get is like, okay, well, uh, portability, that's nice. The portability of software, isn't that solved by containers? Uh, that's something, it's a question I get a lot also from my colleagues within SURF that work more on, for example, cloud computing, and they're like, you know, containers are the solution to everything. Um, well, to me, they're not, and there's a couple of reasons for that, uh, and there's probably more, I just missed a few here. Yes, containers are designed for portability, so yeah, they tend to be very portable, but that's also why they are built typically without any hardware-specific optimization, right? Because you don't know what hardware your user is going to run it on, uh, those containers are usually generically optimized. Of course, you could make a different choice, right? You could build multiple copies of the container, et cetera. So it's, it's solvable, but nobody does, right? Uh, they're quite large and bulky, like uh, containers easily several gigabytes. So if you just want to use a single small tool, you have to pull in a full container just to use that one tool. It's not very efficient, not very friendly on your networking either, especially if you, you know, if you have a lot of users doing this on your HPC system at the same time. It's a pretty static environment. Uh, so if you have a container as a user and then you think, oh, I need just one additional tool, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna rebuild the container or you're gonna pull in another one just to provide that one tool? Not very flexible. 
and it's a lot of duplication. Essentially, each container is a full software stack. Uh, does the software in that container do what you expect it to do? Have you tested that? Are you going to test that for all the containers that you work with? And essentially, your testing problem is no longer testing one software stack, but testing many software stacks. That makes the problem even harder. So, yeah, we had a look around and we figured, okay, let's, you know, let's not throw away the good part, right? So containers are isolated from the host because they have their own OS. And as Bart already mentioned, that is exactly what the compatibility layer also does for the Alliance. And that is also why we use a compatibility layer as well in Easy. Um, and of course, we also had a good look at what the Alliance is doing. Uh, they have a shared software stack that works between their systems. Uh, so we had a very careful look, what do they do? What do we want to do differently here in Europe? Uh, of course, they do it for their systems. We want to make it a little bit more community driven and uh, make, do things like community contributions, et cetera. Um, and also support a wider range of, uh, of architectures, right? I mean, we know what kind of systems you have in Canada. Here, we want it to basically work on, well, any architecture is a big word, but a lot of architecture. So how do we get there? Uh, well, we take a big cook pot and then we put some ingredients in. The first one is Gen2 Prefix. So that is this compatibility layer. Uh, it provides abstraction from our host OS, uh, as is also done by a container OS. Second ingredient is EasyBuild. Um, it could, in theory, be any build tool, right? but we use EasyBuild simply because a lot of the people in the project are familiar with EasyBuild. Uh, that helps us to do optimized builds for a large range of uh, range of hardware architectures, and there's also, of course, a large scientific software that is supported in Easy Build. Uh, finally, we need a way to get it to the end user system, so that's where we use certainly MFS. And this was also already mentioned yesterday, right? Archspec is a tool to detect what is the architecture of the machine that you're working on, uh, and in Easy we use that to determine, okay, which copy of the stack are we actually going to serve to, right? So we basically have multiple copies of the same software stack optimized for different hardware architectures. And then at runtime, when you mount the easy stack, we'll decide, okay, you are running on Skylake-based system. You know, we'll point you to the Skylake prefix with all of the software that's in there. Uh, so this is another view, abstract view of what it looks like. So we have a host operating system underneath, right? Then we have the file system layer, which is this term PMFS that takes care of the distribution of our software stack, the compatibility layer to provide the isolation from the host, and then finally the software layer that contains all of the end user applications. Um, of course, there are some connections there, like uh, Bart also said, like they have this gray area, right? Uh, when it comes to drivers, when it comes to an MPI, uh, yeah, you can discuss where that should be, and maybe you should be able to use the host MPI um, uh, because you know that that works better. Um, so we're also looking into how to support those kind of things. A little bit about CERN VMFS. Um, so it was developed by CERN to distribute software on the worldwide computing grid. So actually the way in which the Alliance and in which Easy use CERN VMFS is exactly what it's meant for, right? So we're not using the tool in any way. It's just a POSIX read-only file system. Uh, which is mounted in user space, and you, uh, yeah, basically you can serve it over the web. Right? It's a web-based file system. Uh, there's a strong focus on redundancy and I/O performance. Uh, you can set up multiple layers of caching, multiple mirrors, um, and of course that's also needed, like in a worldwide compute grid. That also involves a lot of nodes, right? Uh, so yeah, they need to have uh, sufficient redundancy uh, there as well. And the nice thing over containers is that this pulls in files as they are needed. Right? So you can pull in a single script from the EC repository if that's just the one script that you need. You don't need to pull in the full well, and anything from the compatibility layer that that script uses, but you don't need to pull in, uh, pull in the full software stick if you don't need it. Uh, a little bit of a graphic, what it looks like. So the Stratum Zero basically contains the master copy, right? That is sort of the, the the determining factor of what is in the software stack. The Stratum 1's mirror that Stratum 0, uh, and they provide the redundancy and the load distribution. And then there can be several layers of caching. So you can have a reverse proxy in between. You can have a local cache on the system itself. Um, and that is displayed here. And then anything, you, you know, you can connect an HPC cluster to it. You can connect a laptop to it. It doesn't matter. 
So the compatibility layer, um, also we use Gen2 Prefix because it's convenient uh, and also because we had a good discussion with the Alliance, you know, why not mix? Um, it basically is limited to the low level stuff. So things like glibc are provided by the Gen2 layer. Uh, there's a couple of low level dependencies that we don't use from EasyBuild anymore, but from Gen2 Prefix. Um, and we support currently three processor families, so ARM, uh, PowerPC, and uh, x86. And it basically creates a level playing field for the software layer that can be built on top. Right? <clears throat> so the software layer, that's where we optimize for different micro architectures. So we have basically uh, different prefixes uh, where we optimize for you know, Zen 2, Zen 3, uh, Graviton 2, Graviton 3, um, the different Intel architectures, etc. Um, so all of this is installed with EasyBuild, everything that's in the software layer, and the best subdirectory for the host is automatically selected by us, like as I mentioned before. So, you know, your end user doesn't have to know about what hardware they're running on. They can just mount the scheme of a stack and, and go. Uh, it's also very useful if you don't know which hardware you're going to land on, right? So if you have a heterogeneous partition, we used to have that at SURF, it's kind of uh, annoying to then get the right optimization for your software. This makes it very easy. So we have a proof of concept going. Uh, there's a pilot stack there. It doesn't contain a huge list of software because that was not the point of the pilot stack. Right? It was just for us to learn and show how this can work. Uh, there's a CERN VMFS uh, Stratum 0 running in Groningen, and we have four Stratum 1 servers. Um, then we have a couple of software packages just to illustrate how it works, and the hardware targets that we support are listed underneath here. So it's basically the most recent of Intel, AMD, and ARM. So what is this multi-X scale thing that you might have heard in the hallways? Uh, Kenneth already mentioned it shortly yesterday. So multi-X scale is a European project. It's a Euro HPC center of excellence. It's focused on multi-scale modeling. And we have a 6 million euro budget spread across 13 sites. And it's a four-year project. We just started this year. And it's essentially a collaboration between the SICOM network, which is the center for atomic and molecular simulations. They do a lot of scientific software development as well. And several partners in, uh, in, in EASY. Um, and we have five main work packages, three of which are technical, so they are really doing code development uh, for this multi-scale modeling. And two of them are technical, and they are basically about developing and supporting uh, EASY. And through that, we want to facilitate the scientific work packages. Um, so what do those technical work packages look like? Well, the first one is really about developing the EASY software stack, developing additional features, make it more mature, uh, add new architectures to it, uh, et cetera. And the second work package is more about maintaining and monitoring the quality of the software stack, uh, making sure that the performance today is also the same as the performance last week, uh, and about processing community contributions that come in. Um, some key benefits here of the multi x scale project to EASY is that multi x scale has dedicated funding, right? EASY does not. We used to just work on EASY in our spare time, on our Friday afternoons, or whenever we could find some time. Uh, but now we actually have some dedicated resources uh, to work on these. And the nice thing is also that the project plan that we wrote for multi x scale also gives a little bit of a roadmap, a little bit of direction to, to easy to the project. Because we know what multi x scale will be working and focusing on. Um, also in multi x scale, of course, we have this connection with the scientific work packages. So they, these are basically end users of easy right and that gives us a nice feedback loop we can talk to these people and ask them what works for you you know what barriers are you hitting when you're using this environment uh, we also want to stimulate to you know to make easy available on more clusters definitely within the consortium you know we have a couple of hpc centers there uh, that will make an effort to make it available uh, we'll also start conversations with uh, uh, the admins of the euro hpc systems to see if we can make it available there, what we really need. Um, and finally, we'll provide training uh, for admins who want to roll this out on their HPC system. Like, you know, what do you need to do in order to make sure that this actually performs? Also, when a couple of hundred nodes are using this software stack. Uh, and also for end users. How should you use this as an end user? 
So then a little bit about what we're working on today and in the near future. Um, so I'll start with the file system layer. Uh, on that part, we're trying to get a new start from zero server in place, physical one this time, so that we can actually plug a UBT in. Uh, this is one of the ways in which we want to improve the security, because if you can deploy something on the start from zero, it gets deployed to a lot of systems in the world. Right? So that's a security uh, thing you want to think about, so we need to properly secure that. Uh, and it's also a prerequisite, actually, of the CERN GMFS developers that if you want to be part of their default set of configurations, oh, I see Kenneth says, uh, sort of selfish mode. Sort of selfish mode. Okay, we want to do a good job if, before we ask them, can we be included there in the set of default uh, uh, configurations? And that would also help us create more impact, right? Because if we are in the set of default configurations for CMFS, anyone who installs the CMFS uh, RPM or Debian package, they will also get access to the EC repository. Um, in terms of the compatibility layer, uh, Bart already hinted at some collaboration here. Um, we've been trying to create a new version of the compatibility layer and had some issues along the way. The bootstrap script of Gentoo Prefix that should do this installation of the compatibility layer was uh, given some issues. Um, for x86 and for ARM, that now works as far as I understand. I've not been working on this myself, so some of it is a little bit, the details uh, are not known to me. Um, but I do know that this comes also from collaboration with the Alliance. So I know that Bart actually looked at the x86 problems. I know that Bob from Easy actually looked at the ARM problems. Uh, and I think this is, you know, even if we don't use the same compatibility layer, at least we can benefit by working with the same tool. Yep. Yeah, I see that in the protocol of collaboration. Yeah. But just to repeat. Yeah, for the audience back home, uh, Bart remarked that it's also a collaboration with the Gentoo developers themselves. They, uh, we have a good connection with them, both the Alliance and the EC. So another thing that I've seen a, a big, big push over the past months is the way in which we process community contributions. So this was sort of a slide. Uh, this was our aim. We wanted to build this type of pipeline uh, where we have a contributor who says, okay, I want to you know, deploy a certain software package in Easy, um, and then what? Like, what kind of review process does that need to go through? How do we build that software for the different architectures, et cetera? And I'll go through it step by step because that's, that's where most of the development has been. Um, so basically the idea is that the contributor first does a pull request to the software layer and says, okay, I want to add you know, this package, this Easy config. Then there's a reviewer on the bottom left. Uh, he checks, you know, is this same? Is there nothing weird here? Uh, if it looks okay, uh, he can add the bot build label to the GitHub issue, uh, to the GitHub PR. And then it gets picked up by a bot that's running in AWS. Uh, this is running in a virtual cluster on AWS. It can spin up a lot of different types of nodes with different architectures. And those actually do the builds of the software on these different architectures. They'll be packaged in tarballs. And that is basically where this first step ends, and the bot will report back to the PR and say, okay, you know, I successfully built this tarball for this in this particular architecture. Then the next step, the reviewer can have a look again. Uh, does it still make sense? Is it still okay? He can add the bot deploy label. That means these tarballs get uploaded to the S3 bucket. And again, the bot will report back about this step. Oh, I did the uploading. It's now there in the S3 bucket. The next step is a cron job that is running on the Stratum Zero server that is polling the S3 bucket for new tarballs. And as soon as there's a new tarball, it will download it to the Stratum Zero. That will not immediately deploy it in the CVMFS environment. So it will not yet be publicly available, but it will just be on the, uh, on the same uh, server. And this cron job will also create a PR to our staging repository. So that's easy slash staging. Uh, again, that gives a reviewer a chance to look at it. It will list which modules are going to be added by this PR. Um, and if, uh, if the reviewer says, okay, this is fine, I can just merge the PR and the cron job on the starting zero ceased. This PR is now merged. I can now actually ingest it into the CVMFS repository on the starting zero. And then it's available to all of the users who have access to the easy software stack. Another thing we've been working on is the GPU support, uh, specifically NVIDIA GPU support. Uh, there's a couple of challenges here. Uh, of course, we have to deal with the end user license agreement of CUDA, which does not allow us to redistribute 
everything that would be in a normal EG++ module. Um, so what we do there is we have a script that checks in the ULA which files are we allowed to redistribute. Anything we're not allowed to redistribute is replaced by a symlink, which points to a special directory, uh, which is uh, created in EC, which is the host injections. So this is basically where you put anything as a, as a sysadmin that should be picked up from the system. Right? So you can put an additional full CUDA SDK installation there, uh, and then it gets picked up from the system. Second challenge is that uh, yeah, if you use a very new CUDA library, it doesn't always work with all the drivers. Of course, on the easy side, we don't know what GPU drivers are being used on a certain host. Uh, we cannot really help that either, right? But we can make it easier uh, uh, for the host system to support newer versions of CUDA. You can install compatibility layers that increase this compatibility range a little bit. It's still not indefinite, right? But it's a little bit larger range. So we provide a script that makes it easy for you. And again, this is uh, installed in this host injections directory. And the third challenge, and that's one we haven't solved yet, that's still a work in progress, is that Easy actually uses a build container uh, for technical reasons that I won't go into. Um, but in that container, we have to mount the CUDA drivers, and that's by uh, singularity that's mounted in a non standard location, and that's currently giving some installation issues. So we need to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, software testing, um, also mentioned uh, before, we actually use Reframe. Um, so we had a nice presentation on Reframe yesterday. One feature that was mentioned was that you can now specify what the features are that a certain partition supports, right? That was a request from us uh, because basically we want to uh, separate anything that is system specific into one configuration file, the Reframe configuration file, and the test should be completely uh, like they should know nothing about the system, right? Because we, the test developers, know nothing about the host system that this is going to run on. So they should look at the configuration file and make some decisions and do something reasonable based on that configuration file. Uh, so very simply put, if in the configuration file it says this is a uh, partition that only has CPUs, right? It doesn't have GPUs. You should not generate the reframe GPU test. Uh, similarly, uh, you might have an application where it makes sense to, uh, you know, if it's pure MPI, where it makes sense to typically just fill the node with MPI ranks, you know, one rank per CPU core, and it can take the core count from the reframe configuration file and just fill it up. So these kind of sort of standard uh, uh, things are, are being done here. Uh, we created one blueprint test based on Gromax. Um, because Gromax, well, you know, it supports CPUs and supports GPUs, so it was a good use case. It's something we know very well. And we try to try to make this a blueprint that we can use later to create more portable tests. So all of the system-specific part has been taken out of that Gromax test. Uh, we've tried to generalize it as much as possible, put reusable components in there that can also be used in other tests. For example, this, you know, launch one rank per core that you have that can just be a standard function that is probably useful to more tests. Right? Um, and this is actually, so trying to make this portable uh, right now, it is as portable. Uh, I can actually run the same test suite on my own local module stack. That's also easy build. So, you know, the naming is kind of similar, so that helps. Um, but yeah, it shows some of the portability here. And I think, but if you guys want to use this, I think it will just work. At least that's what it should do. Question in the back. Yes. No, so, uh, yeah, so this is a good question. In the back, uh, there was a question that reframe tends to also be used to test performance. For now, we're only looking at functionality. Uh, we also want to do performance testing, but that is even more difficult to do in a portable way, right? Because what is the expected performance of a Gromax run on a system you don't know? Uh, that, that's going to be a hard problem to solve. So either we do something and make it easy to, I don't know, uh, point to a local database, which contains the reference numbers for, you know, what the performance of that test should be, or make an educated guess based on the hardware that is there. Could be another way to go, but then you still need pretty wide threshold, like pretty wide acceptance threshold. Yeah, that is something we haven't we haven't solved yet.
Um, for easy itself, you know, we'll probably have some fixed test infrastructure where we can actually know the performance, right? And then so we can still test the easy software stack in general. But if you as an end user want to check, does the easy software stack actually perform as expected on my HPC system? Yeah, what's the reference for that? You'll have to put that in yourself one way or another. All right, so some future activities. Um, the bot is not finished, uh, it's working, but we can definitely do some refinements there. Uh, one of the things is that, you know, if, if one of the architectures fails to build, right, maybe you have seven tarballs and one is missing, um, you just want to be able to re-trigger that one build. That is currently not possible. Um, also for debugging, right now it's kind of a black box, right? If a contributor says, oh, I want to build this easy config, uh, this whole build system gets launched, it starts building these tarballs. If something fails along the way, you don't have any way of getting to the log file or to inspect the files that are there. Um, because of course those build nodes, you know, we don't want them to be completely publicly accessible. Uh, so what we'll probably do there is provide a downloadable container that just gives you the container that was used for building. And then you can see, you know, all of the log files that were there uh, at the time that the build failed. And you can see if we can get it going from there or figure out what the issue was. Um, also, the software testing is not yet integrated yet uh, uh, as a step in this, uh, in this workflow yet. So that is something we'll add. So basically, we want to launch reframe tests uh, probably right after the build for single node tests. And then in the staging step, we probably want to also run multi node tests to check if it works before we actually deploy it in the production environment. Uh, for the test suite, we're looking to add more low level tests as well. Uh, so something like the OSU tests uh, that will definitely be useful. Uh, because, yeah, if your Gromex fails, then it's because of some communication issue. It's nicer if you can just check the communication separately right, in a separate test. And now that we have a kind of sensible blueprint, we want to also expand on the amount of high-level application tests that we have. And as I mentioned, also the other thing we want to look at is how do we do this portable performance testing? That is not a solved problem, but we'll just try to see what works. Um, we'll also be looking to expand hardware support. So now we're working on NVIDIA GPU support. I think that's a sensible start, uh, but we also want to check AMD support. Uh, in the uh, in the more distant future, we'll be looking at Risk Five support. Um, we will also give trainings. So again, this is something from the Multi X Scale project as well um, that has a training work package in it. The first end user training will actually be this May already um, at the HPCKT uh, event that was already mentioned earlier. Uh, that's organized by HPC now, right? And we'll also develop some training material for system administrators that want to host the easy software stack uh, on their own HPC system. Uh, two more things. Uh, we want to also support um, extending the easy software stack with a local stack. So either on a local file system or it could be your own CMFS file system, right? Um, this can be useful for proprietary software. Uh, it will enable you to do faster deployments, right? Because if you have to, you know, the nice thing about Easy is that it's going to have a pretty good QA procedure. Uh, but what will not be so nice is that it, it will take a bit of time, right? A reviewer needs to look at this, uh, and if you know if it poses issues, if some tests fail, you need to look into it, uh, you need to solve it, and maybe you just want to help your user tomorrow, right? Then it's nice if you have a local environment where you can just deploy it, whatever the quality assurance is, and then go through the QA of Easy to make it available to everybody. Or maybe you just want to support a, a local software developer, right? And they just want to deploy development versions of their software on your local system. That might be fine, but you don't want to push that into the gen general CC repository. Um, in multi scale, we'll also explore some use cases uh, where we want to see how can we use Easy in a CI environment. Um, if you want to do CI on your own uh, on your own software, you know you first have to install all of your dependencies with Easy. That's actually quite Easy because you just mount it, right? So you can have all of your dependencies available uh, in less than a minute. Uh, so we think it can be helpful in CI environments too. And I think, yep, that wraps up the talk. I still have a demo. Do we have time? Um, 
let me see on the page. Yeah, so basically, if you want to install it, uh, if you have a VM or whatever, you can just install CVMFS, and then there's a second step to install the easy configuration. That will eventually be one step, right? So as soon as we become a default configuration in CVMFS, it's just you install CVMFS should be enough. Uh, then there is a step to activate the Avana, so you store your bash script and that makes this uh, module environment available to you and then you can just load whatever module is in these environments that you want to use. And in this case I want to show you a two node run on our supercomputer. Uh, we have the easy environment available. Um, we actually did not put proper caching in place yet, so one of the things you see right now it should not be a problem because it's actually cached locally on the node. But the first time I'm on a new node and I do a module AV, it takes quite a long time because there's no proper caching in between. That's one of the things we want to explain in this sysadmin training, like how do you set that up, right? How do you make sure that this feels like a, a local file system or network file system? So what you see here on the top, I did an hstop command on both of the nodes that are involved in this job. This will take a minute. So if there are questions, we can cover the questions now, and then hopefully by the end we'll see the result. Yes, in the back. Oh, wait, do we do no. microphone or I repeat it? Okay. Uh, how complete is your uh, of the software? So right now it's just, you know, two hands full of software, that's it. Um, it's not about completeness yet. It's like we need to have this proper community contribution procedure in place. It needs to be pretty well automated because we expect you know more and more contributions will come in and if you start too early you'll just be working on processing those community contributions rather than working on the automation right so we want to make sure that we're ready to process a larger volume of these and that we understand well enough you know how do we one of the things we're still deciding on is how much do we put in the compatibility layer right? that takes some experience to figure out what works what doesn't work you don't want to make these bigger changes later on when you already have an enormous software stack deployed and a lot of people are relying on it. Right? Now it's much easier for us to just decide, okay, next iteration, the, the compatibility layer is going to look completely different. Nobody cares. They know it's a pilot. Yes, of course. <laughs> True. Uh, oh, so the, the question is how will we organize support for this, right? Because the local site, well, they know their system, but they don't necessarily know how the software does, was deployed, and the other way around, the person who deployed the software in Easy doesn't know the local system. Uh, yeah, that, that is tricky. That's true. Um, but then I think we are, in the end, one community. Uh, so we can. I think the the way we have to do this is to keep talking to each other, right? If we all work on the easy software stack like back are we back yeah um so yeah so the question was on support right in the coming years we have the multi x scale project and well i mean our primary focus for support will be the other scientific work packages within the project but any time we have left we're more than willing to spend on the community because that's also where we learn right we learn what works and what doesn't work um but yeah we'll we'll have to talk to the sysadmin to understand the local system that's for sure Question in the back. Breaking all the last one. 
<laughs> so the question is, are the packages going to be exclusively installed by EasyBuild, or is this going to be our last EasyBuild user meeting? Um, I don't know if it's going to be exclusively by EasyBuild uh, for the foreseeable future. I think so. Um, again, since that is what most of us in the Easy project have experienced with. Um, but if there is somebody who says, look, you know, I have spec experience. I think Easy is great, but it should support spec. Yeah, I mean, we're very open to have that discussion and to see how we can support it. I don't think EasyBuild will ever go away from Easy. That, I don't see that happening. No, I mean, so Easy is not replacing Easy Build. Indeed, uh, as I said, you know, you might have reasons to still install stuff locally uh, if you want to tune installations, if you want to use slightly different versions, if you want to use a development version. Uh, there's still plenty of reasons to want some form of local spec, right? And there, you probably still want to use Easy Build as well. Um, if you already have everything in your local stack, there's no added benefit, right? Uh, but that means you have to maintain a pretty big stack, right? Maybe, I think, I think the be benefit of Easy is that for all of the standard stuff, you can probably use it from the Easy software stack. If you want something very specific, you'll probably install it locally. One problem we now see a lot with Easy is that you will work in the copy file, what <laughs> this is too long a story to repeat. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues we currently see a lot with EasyBuild is that somebody comes up with an easy config file, it works for them. Maybe it even works on another system they tested it on. But on a third system, it doesn't work, right? Because of slash temp being mounted differently, not big enough, uh, OS dependencies that are missing, or extra stuff that's installed in the OS that's accidentally tipped up. So all of these, all of these things that, that differ in the build environment cause trouble. In Easy, that's way more controlled because we have a very controlled build environment, and we're basically all working in the same operating system in, to some extent. Um, so I think that's, that's going to make um, sharing installations and, and getting stuff to work a lot easier. And once someone has done it once, the other people just use it, right? They don't need to reinstall and, and make sure it works for them as well. That's the key difference. Yeah. Yeah, so a remark uh, from the audience is that it will work the same way everywhere, so the same physical installation, right? This is 99% true. Um, of course, there's still different optimizations, right? And we have seen in the past, not within Easy, but in other cases, that optimizations can sometimes change the runtime behavior of your code. Uh, you know, some bugs are specific to AVX 512 optimization, for example. So this can still happen, right? But in principle, yeah. They're built in exactly the same way. Yeah. Well, I'm not discussing numerical. Numerical, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to happen for everyone. That's true. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, if, yeah, if you, you run it on the same hardware and then you give it to your colleague and he runs it on the same hardware, it should run the same way. Is it project based in <laughs> this is a difficult one. When, when is it done enough? That's always a challenging thing. To play with it is definitely good enough. Yes. Yeah. Would it work in such an environment? Sorry, I forget to repeat the question. So the question is, is it already worth trying to see if this works on my system, right? And, and in this case, uh, it's a particular system with some security things in place, and you want to know, does it work there? Yes, it's definitely worth giving it a try already. Uh, it's not something that I would just give to users and say, you know, this is production ready, go ahead. The module is there, uh, have fun. If you have more technically interested users, right, who are into software development themselves and they like something new and they want to give it a try, sure, but yeah, not, not just for regular production run yet. The recommendation is, is a good step. There's, a, there's like a getting started part in documentation that explains you how to get access. 
either a native installation of CGMFS or using our easy client container, um, and then how to run the demos like uh, well, very close to what Casper has showed. It's definitely ready for that. And yeah, please try it out and let us let us know if you run into any trouble. Any anything that any problems that are raised now, uh, we can be aware of and try to fix it in the next iteration. So that's sort of the reason why we. Uh, there's there's multiple reasons we have this this pilot repository. One is to show to ourselves that we can do it, like what what the Canadians have been doing. That's one thing. Another thing is to let other people play with it. But it was also a way to to actually get funding and and see it. tell whoever was uh, was listening to us like we can do this. Like we 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 have a handful of software, and getting the software in there is not going to be the biggest problem. It's all the automation, the community, and all that stuff. This is an excellent question. So policy is something that we still have to decide on. Um, I mean, it would be great, right? If we have a reframe. Oh, sorry, repeat the question. Yes, uh, so the question was for community contributions, uh, do we need a reframe test for all of the community contributions? And yeah, so I mean, it would be great in the ideal world. I would say, yes, this is a hard requirement. But that also makes it a very big barrier for people to contribute, right? Because suddenly they need to know easy build because they need to create an easy config if it's not there yet. They need to know reframe. And they need to know the particular way that we do portable testing with reframe, which is you know not not the standard. So that is I can imagine that's quite tricky. So I think it's more realistic to say we'll try to stimulate it as much as we can and make it very transparent, which software is actually tested with reframe tests and which isn't, right? Just make kind of a support matrix and visualize that. I think it will go in that direction, but you know, the jury is still out on it. There's a, question, there's a question in Slack as well from, it's a funny one because it's from Thomas, who's involved in Nokia. <laughs> but uh, he's asking, there's lots of development activities, but how about activities to put in easy to, easy to use? Any plans on rolling it out to end users? Good question, Kenneth. Any plans? <laughs> well, plan, and, and in Ghent, it's already easy, is already mounted, so it's available. If people know it, they can play with it. Yeah. And and that's the case, I think, in some Norwegian systems as well. I think it's the case at Surf as well. Yeah. So if you know it's there, you can play with it. You can probably ask support for questions, and they're going to be annoyed if you do. But we actually also have a cloud environment at Surf, and we're also going to roll it out there. So there, they will just get a template VM that has the easy stack mounted. And you can give it a try. I, personally, I would, if I see a reviewer coming along on our system that I think, hey, you're technical, you, you know, you could find this interesting, I would like to give people uh, a nudge to give it a try and see how it goes. And I think we should also organize because we think that this makes it much easier to move from one system to another, right? We should really try to do that. Like ask the user, have your use case on your local HPC cluster see how much time it takes you to now move to our system right? with with or without easy um, so that is something you know i've in the back of my head but i still have to find the right user 